Okay, well, I assume there's no questions because we don't have a homework assignment due today. <laughs> Is that right? Or does yeah. anyone have any questions? All right then. Any of you guys out there have questions? Too bad. <laughs> 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 oh, oh no. I hope I don't get the giggles now. All right, so last time uh, we were talking about address decoding. And remember, there's two kinds of, there's two problems that are involved whenever you hook together several smaller memory modules to make one larger memory module. And the easy one is when you have, uh, you don't have enough data lines to populate the whole data bus. But in that case, you just put them in parallel, you know. We saw, we saw an example of how to do that. But this second one is the situation where the data lines on the chips, the number of data lines on each chip matches the number of data lines in the data, on the data bus. But we want to populate, but the number of address lines of each chip is much less than the number of address lines on the address bus. And we, need to, we want to be able to wire the chips into the system in such a way that we map each physical device to a particular location on the memory map of the system. Do you remember that? How, do you remember that that was the two things that we did? And then we were kind of rushed at the end of class last time. And so let's, let's review how we did that, this second problem. So we, we had an example with eight address lines and four chips. One is a 64-byte RAM, another is a 32-byte RAM, another is an eight-port input-output chip, and another one is a 32-byte ROM. And then um, here on figure 11.46 is the desired memory map. Are you with me? So what we want to do is we want to know physically how to map, to wire our chips on the board so that the big RAM starts at address 0, the smaller RAM starts at address 64, the input output port the input output chip starts at what address? Halfway between 192 and 224, what's that? Oh, we don't have our oh, calculator here. Okay. Is it 208? Go back to the slide it told you. Hmm? On the other side it told you. Oh, it told us on the other slide. At, oh, at address 208, right, at 208. And then we want the ROM to be at the, start at address 224 and go up to the end. Yeah, question? That's a good question. The colors are the areas of memory that are spanned by the individual chips. So you see, look, the, here. The question is, what does the color mean on the slides? Look, do you see that this, that this first RAM is a 64-byte RAM? Well. If you look at figure 11.46, it starts at 0, and at in, the first byte starts at address 0, and the, sec, and the last byte ends at address 63. So all of this blue here represents the, um, represents the fact that this chip is going to be, let me see, how do I say this? The, 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 the bytes in that chip are the bytes, are going to be the bytes from address 0 to address 63. And this blue indicates that that chip is supplying these bytes, those bytes in that region. So notice that the blue that starts at the second RAM, from, it goes from address 64 to address 96. Instead of, being, instead of being 64 bytes, that's only 32 bytes. Are you with me? And then what does this white area indicate? Free space. Hmm? Yeah, it's just free space. Is it possible to access that? Or the question is, is it possible to access that or do we need more chips? The answer is, to access it in a useful way, we would need more chips. But now you guys, look, 
This is way, way typical. Because are you, are you not familiar with the concept that you can buy a computer and do what later if you, you don't want to spend the money? If you want to spend more money later, you can do what? You can expand memory. Are you with me? So what you're doing when you expand memory is you're buying chips and you're plugging them into the board and it has to be wired in such a way that the unused space then now is populated by the new chips that you bought. But you can the new, it on the end. Well, the system designer, the operating system assumes that certain portions of the memory are dedicated to certain tasks. And so you can't just willy-nilly put them in at oddball places because the system expects and generally expects them to be contiguous. Okay. You see, like generally there's no gaps, you know. Are you with me? But, the, but all that has to be designed, I mean you have to follow their, the design specifications whenever you add memory. So you can't just add, you know, and the, yeah, so there are, there are restrictions, but it comes about by, by this. And those white spaces are like room for future expansion. Is everybody clear on this? On how to, and now, so the question is, how do we decide the key, the key to um, having our devices mapped to certain regions of memory is the chip select line on the chip. Because if chip select, if CS is 1, what does that mean? The chip select is active and the data is being put on the bus. Are you with me? Whereas if chip select is zero, what does that mean? It's disabled and it's as if it's not connected to the bus at all. So what did we say had to be true about this first RAM, the 64 byte RAM? What, what, in order for it to occupy addresses zero through 63, then we went to this table in figure 11.47 and we look at this column under 64 by eight RAM and we said, look, the minimum address is 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, and the maximum address is 00111111. Are you with me? But look, so when should this device be active? This device should be active when the first two leading ad signals on the address line, the first two, the, the most significant lines of the address bus have to be what? If they are what? Yeah. Zero, zero, then this chip should be selected. Now does everybody see that from this table? Because we want it to go from zero, 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 to zero, zero, one, 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 one. So that means if the first two address lines are zero, this chip should be selected. And furthermore, let's take a look at this at the second one, 32 by 8. And furthermore, this second RAM should be disabled, right? So, what, so how do we do that? So now let's go to figure 11.48 and see how we do that. So here we have this, oh, and by the way, on this figure 11.48, the only thing we are showing here are the address lines and the chip select line. And we are ignoring, just because the figure would be too cluttered, we are ignoring the data lines. But can you, can you tell me how the data lines are all connected on all these? Because each one of these has how many data lines? What did we say here? What did we say these devices were? Yeah, actually, did I? We, we might not have said. We actually, we actually, we, we might not have said. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess that was a bum question. <laughs> Let's just assume that there are eight data lines on each chip. Actually, there, as long as it's the same on each chip, there could be eight. There could be sixteen. Are you with me? Let's just say that th that it's a eight. That it's an eight. So that they have the same number. It, with this, we are assuming that there's the same number of data lines. And so if we come here to figure 11, back here to figure 11.48, we're not showing the data lines, but how are the data lines connected? They're bi-directional. And can you tell me how they're connected? Okay. 
Are you talking about where they go? The, yeah, where they go. Because see, this is just the address bus. This is not the data bus. Right. So if we, we, so we would have a separate data bus. Like down below and then connected. Down below and they would, yeah, yeah well. Well, and then it would be connecting to the other side, like the bi-directional. Yeah, okay, let's, yeah. So, so what would happen is there would be eight data, there would be the data bus is separate from the address bus, yes. okay? And, the, and if it was an eight bit data bus, the data bus would be all along down here and all eight lines here from the first chip would go to that mm -hmm. and these would go to the, to the same one and these would go to the same one and these would go to the same one. In other words, they would all share that same line. Are you with me? The, I didn't want to draw that because, I mean, that would make it really messy. But does everybody see that those data lines all go like that? All right, and now let's take a look at our first RAM. What did we say? If the first, if, if the two high order address lines are zero, zero, what did we want to do? Chip select, Chip select the big RAM. So look. Look at line A6 here. A6 comes along here and it goes down here to this AND gate. And what does that little circle mean? No. Invert. So I didn't want to have to draw an inverter because it would take up too much room on the figure. Mm -hmm. So are you with me? And then A7 comes along and that's inverted and it goes into this AND gate. So when will this chip be selected? If, A, if A7, A6 is 0, 0, then this AND gate will be, well, the output will be one, and this chip will be selected. And furthermore, let's take a look at the second RAM, at the second RAM chip. If A7, A6 is zero, zero, what's gonna happen? If A7 is zero, that gets inverted, and that's a one. But if A6 is zero, that doesn't get inverted. And so what do we know about this chip select? And it doesn't even matter what A5 is. Are you with me? Because A6 is zero and it's not inverted going through this AND gate. The chip select for the 32 byte RAM is zero and it's not selected. And furthermore, what about the eight port IO? If we look at, if it's zero, zero. Well, there's some zeros coming into this AND gate. So this is not selected. And, if, and, and look at the 32 by 8 bit ROM. Oh, I have it here by 8 bit. I do have it here. So it is an 8 bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then, and this, and so this is a, um, a six, if, so if, if A7, A6 is 0, 0, then the 32 by 8 bit ROM is also not selected. Does everybody see how that worked? Is everybody with me on this? And so let's go back and take a look at another one. The, so if you look at the minimum address and the maximum address of the small RAM, now these X's on the last line mean what? Don't care. These X's here mean we don't care what this pattern is. Are you with me? As long as the first three bits are zero, 010, zero, then this RAM should be selected and this RAM should not be selected. Are you with me? So here, if we come here, if we come here, this is, so A7, A6, A5, if that's zero, 010, zero, then we see that zero inverted is one, one is just one, zero inverted is one, so this second RAM is selected. And furthermore, because A7 is going to be, no wait. What, why is this one going to be turned off if it's zero, A6 one, one, zero? Because A6 is one, and so that's going to be inverted be zero, and so that'll turn this one off. Now does everybody see that? And similarly for uh, the eight port IO, because look, let's look at the leading bits for the eight port IO. The eight port, I, the eight port input output uh, module, it goes from one one zero one zero 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 to one one zero one zero one one one. So in general, it's one one zero one zero xxx. 
So when should that be selected? When the input lines are, when the, when the high order address lines are 11010. Zero, one, zero. So if we look here at the input of this chip select, look, it's 11010. Yeah? So that's, that will select this. And similarly, what? 111 will select the ROM. Are you with me? Because if we look at this table for the ROM addresses, it's one, it has to, if the leading address bits are, address lines are 111, then that chip will be selected. All right, now is everybody with me on this? Are we good? Okay, now, guess what? Suppose you have some really humongous address bus, like a 64-bit address bus, all right? But you only want to use, you know, you, do you know, what's 2 to the 64? Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's ter is, is, isn't, it, isn't it billions of terabytes? Two, yeah, what's the terabyte? Is that two to the, f wait, two to the 40, how did that work? Yeah, it's two to, it's, it's two, two to the 10, two to the 20, two to the 30, two to the 40, two to the 50, two to the 60, right? And two to the 10 is 1K, right? Two to the 20 is a what? Is a meg, two to the 30 is a what? A gig. Is everybody? Two to the 40 is a what? Is a tera. Right? So two to the 64 is billions. It's, it's, like, it's like billions of terabytes. I, you, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's more than, it's really big. So you're not going to need to have a byte, I mean, it'd be physically impossible to have all that, to have all, all, have all that filled, but, you know, 64 bits, what if that's how many, how big your address is? So anyway, the, the point of it is, that was an extreme example. Maybe we could, you know, if a, a real system might not use all 64 bits in the address, you know, might not have the address bus be as big as the theoretical number of address lines in the architecture of the chip, all right? So, the point being that the situation might arise where you have a humongous number of, chi of, of data lines, but you, you know that you're not going to use them all. In that case, what we can do is we can save on the circuitry here of how to, of how to select our chips. Do you see what I mean? And in fact, <laughs> do you see, do you see a way to say, re, do you see a way, can, can you kind of imagine, let's go back to our memory map in figure 11.46. If we look at our memory map in figure 11.46, we see the RAM goes from, is at address 0, the second RAM is at address 64, and then there's this, all this blank space here. And then there's an IO chip here, and there's, there. and what we, the way we have it designed now is that if on those address lines, there's a value that's greater than 96 and less than 192, no chip is selected. Right? No chip is selected. But look, if we don't care, if we don't expect to ever be able to access that memory space, what can we do? We can save on the decode circuitry for our chip select. Do you see what I mean? And the way this works is like this. So check this out. This concept is called partial address decoding. And what it does is it enables us to save circuitry on the, save our chip select circuitry whenever we plug in our chips into our system. Are you with me? So look. Here's what we do. We go back, you know, let's go back to this table. 
in figure 11.47. And let's write down the general address for each one of these devices. So the general address for our big ROM is 00XXXXXX. For the 32 by 8 RAM, it's 010XXXXX. For the 8 port IO, it's 11010XXX. And for the 32 by 8 ROM, it's 111XXXXX. So let's go and let's write down each one of those right on top of each other and inspect. Now look. Let's inspect this. Now look. This first line is the 64 by 8 bit RAM. And we have 00XXXXXX, right? And do you see that the second address line, a, I think it's a, how many address lines did we have? Eight. So a, a it's a six, right? The one on the left is a seven, the next one is a six. So look. As we scan down this column, the A6 column, what do we notice? Every single one of those bits is what? One, except for this one. That means that in order to distinguish this chip, the big RAM, from all the other ones, is all we have to do is test what? A6. The A6. And if that A6 is zero, we'll select this RAM. We don't, need, we don't need to actually use the first, the A7 line. Because it is uniquely identified by the A6 line. Yeah. Uh, this only saves on um, the amount of chips you have to use, right? Because the speed would be the same because they all go in at the same time. Exactly. There's no speed penalty at all. This saves on the logic used to, this saves on the chip select logic. And what it does is it takes advantage of the fact that we don't expect the, anyone to access that unused area. We don't expect that to ever occur. And if we don't ever expect that to occur, we can just distinguish between this, this chip with this by, by the A6 line. Are you with me? Yeah. So look, so let, now let's move ahead, let's jump ahead to figure 11.49. Now, what do we have for the chip select for 11.49? Just a single what? A single inverter on A6. Now, how, how is it that we could get away with that? Because if we come back here and we see the way these are listed all, all on top of each other, we see that as long as the second address line is zero, it doesn't, we know it's going to be the RAM because the second bit is one for all the rest of them. So how do we get this? We just do it by inspection, process of elimination and by inspection, and there could be more than one way to do it. Does everybody see that? Is everybody with me on that? And now look, what about, how about selecting the 32 by 8 bit RAM? Well, before it, we had to test three address lines. We can get away with only testing two address lines. Why? Because the first two address lines are what? for this 32 by 8 bit RAM. The first two bits are what? Zero one. Well look, none of the other ones have zero one. Do you see how we deduce that? None of the other ones have zero one for the first two address lines. So as all we need is zero, we don't even have to test the third one. So, so let's go and let, so now let's go to figure 1149 and see how it, and see how we can do that. So look, we only need a two input AND gate with a zero, with a zero one on A7, A6 to select that chip. Are you with me? And let's come back to here and take a look at, at our third, at our eight port IO. This time we need, instead of, what did we, what did, how many bits did we used to have to check on the address lines? We used to have to check one, two, three, four, five, right? But this shows that we only have to check what? Three of them. Because if the first three bits are 110, what do we know about all the other ones? None of them have a 110. So we can uniquely specify this only by testing the first three address lines. 
are you with me? And further about, for, furthermore, what about the ROM? Well, if the first three address lines are 111, none of the other first three have 111. You've got to be careful here, though, because what about our 64 by 8 bit RAM? That's a 00x. So it could be, the first one could have what? 001 there, or it could have 000. But in any case, it's not going to be 111. So we only need three lines to connect this ROM. So, so our 32 by 8 bit ROM, <coughs> if a 7, a 6, a 5 is 111, then that's all we need to do to to do the chip select. Yes? Couldn't you just do this? Uh, um, a5 and a6? Oh, good observation. Maybe. A5, let me see, a7, a6, a6, a5. Oh, did we not? Um, yeah, that's, that is a good observation. If we do that, would we get in Seven. trouble? Oh, zero, one, oh no. Because you're only restricting zero, one. Wait, so her question is, could we do this by having, only checking the A6, A5 being one, one? So that's what you said, right? Yeah, because the other ones can either be one, zero, 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 one. Actually, I think you're right. We could do it with just one, one. If that was just one, one, though? Oh, she's right. That is the counter. That is the problem. Because we are only checking 0, 1 for the 32 by 8 bit RAM. Yeah. Oh, good call. Good call. You had me going there for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's interesting, huh? Yeah, does question? Does doing this prevent you from adding additional memory? It does. Doing this prevents you from adding additional memory. So therefore, you would only do this, you would only do this like in, in your chassis, in your, when you buy a, a computer system, there would have to be the unused spaces, there's, there would only be, how do I say this? The slots you know, the vacant slots that you plug in your, your, your memory modules into, you would, have to, you would have to make sure that only up to, if you fully populate them, how do I say this? It won't conflict. Do you see what I mean? You can only do this, you have to look ahead and know how many memory slots maximum the customer is able to plug in and make sure that you're not overlapping some of that future expansion area. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it does. Okay, now here's an interesting phenomenon, you guys. An interesting phenomenon is this. What, now watch this, let's take a look at this. At this. We have this phenomenon of a clone. Now think about this. This is really interesting. We have the, what, we've, what, we're do, what we're doing here is we are creating clones. Because look, when will I select the 64 by 8 bit RAM? When what? When will I select the 64 by 8 bit RAM? What, according to this partial address decoding scheme we have here. When will we select it? When A6 is 0. That means we will select it when A7, A6 is what? A7, so we will select when we will select it when A7, A6, we will select it. Ah, sloppy writing here. Okay, so we'll select we'll select uh, 64 by 8 bit RAM. under these conditions, A7, A6, we will, we will do it, we will select it when this is 0, 0, or 1, 0. That's when it, it will be selected. Are you with me? It will be selected here, it will be selected two different times. Well, if, it, if, if somebody does, we don't expect this to happen, 
But if somebody does put a one zero on there, what will happen? This chip will be what? Selected. So it's as if, but now what address is this? What address is one zero 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 zero? What address is that? That's 128. So look basically what we've done. We've taken this, so look at figure 11.50. What we've done is we've taken this RAM, which is our first RAM, which is at address zero, and by doing the partial address decoding, we have duplicated it at 128. So if we do anything between 128 and 192, we are actually going to get read the exact same memory, the exact same values that, that, that come there. So as far as the CPU is concerned, it's a clone. It's duplicated. We don't expect that to happen because we're using the fact, we are assuming that those are don't care conditions. But if it does happen, if it does happen and we have, a, then it will be selected. It will be selected when A7, A6 is 0, zero. It'll also be selected when A7, A6 is 1, 0. Are you with me? Which means that if, if the user or if somehow some virus gets in or something and we actually try to access the, the, the between 128 and 192, what's happening is that chip is going to be selected. So what all the data values that are in this area are duplicated here because that chip would be selected under that condition. So that's a clone. And furthermore, what other clones do we have? What other clones do we have? When will we, you know, using the same, using the same uh, thing? What other clones do we have? What did we omit? Here, let's go back to this setup. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. Zero. Okay, say, say that again. Yeah, let's do another one. For the 32 by 8 bit RAM. Okay, so, so for the, so for the uh, we'll select. We'll select 32 by 8 bit RAM. Okay, so let's notate that. Uh, so the 32 by 8 bit, so, so what is it? It's a 0, 1, so it will be selected when we have A7, A6, A5. So what will be the values that will select that? Well, we know that it's going to be selected when it's 0, 1, right? But we're ignoring the th A5. So it will be selected when this is 0, 1, 0, but it will also be selected at what? At 0, 1, 1. So there's a clone there. And what is that 0, 1, 1? So if we come here to this figure 11.50, I've indicated that by saying, here's the original one and there's the clone. Do you see how that, how, do you see why that is? And then, but, and, and what about the 8-port I.O. chip? Originally we said the 8-port I.O. chip was supposed to be where? Let's go back to our original map. We said we are wiring it into what? 208? But look, we, are, we wired that into 208, but with this partial address decoding, not only is it wired into its original location, the 208, but also what? There's clones at 192, here, at 208, I mean 208 is the original, and here. And is there a clone of the ROM? Or did we use all the ones for the ROM? Yeah, see look, if we look at our ROM, we're using all the original ones that we needed anyway, so there's no clone of the ROM. Does everybody see how that, does everybody understand the, the concept of a clone? All right. And so now here's the thing, you guys. Now, you've got to be careful with partial address decoding because, Gesundheit, because what would be really bad if we look at this map and we see that not only is our original device wired at a certain location, but it's cloned somewhere else. What would be really bad? I mean, we don't expect those unused spaces to be accessed, so if we can guarantee that they're not accessed, it's no big deal. But what could go wrong? The clones could do what? Overlap. They could overlap. 
And if the clone, okay, so if the partial addressing is such that you have overlapping clones, and even though you don't expect it to happen, somebody accesses that space, what is going on physically on the data bus? With the tri-state devices. They would both be, yeah, they would both be on, two outputs would be on the same line. The tri-state devices would be turned on for two devices and they'd all be on the same line. Are you with me? That's what would happen. Is everybody, is everybody clear on this, on how, on how this works? So that's the clone, that's, that's the story. And then you have, for your homework assignment, now by the way, I'm away at a conference Thursday, right? So we're handing in Monday? So we're handing in Monday. But I think it's a partial address decoding problem. Okay, so does everybody see how to do this? So what, the way, you basically just follow the same procedure. You, you set these up, you know, you, you set up the addresses where the X's are and then you visually you do, I think you do a full address decoding and a partial address decoding. Okay? Is everybody, any questions about this? Okay. Last thing in chapter 11. Okay, so what we'll do now is we will finish up with um, the two-port register bank. All right, now, uh, here comes you guys. How long ago did you have computer systems? Some people actually have it now. Two years. <laughs> yeah, two years for some people, concurrently with other people. For those of you who had it two years ago, do you remember what is inside the PEP8 CPU? You have no idea, no, you don't I remember? Don't. don't remember what's in it? Let, let, we should review that then, okay. Prep 8 CPU. Because what we're going to do is we are gradually building up from the logic gate level. We're, gonna, we're building up and up and up until we get to the ISA level. And at the ISA level, we, have to, we want to see how the CPU uh, is organized. Computer organization is all about the organization of the CPU. Okay. Now, we need to review what's in here. Okay. So, um, well, those of you who maybe are in computer systems, now, do you remember what's in the PEP8 CPU? Did I say you had to memorize this? I think I said you had to memorize this. Anyway. Can you help us? Can somebody help us out? Status bits, NZVC, mm -hmm. accumulator. accumulator. Oh, look at you. Accumulator. And each one of these is one bit, right? Accumulator. What else? Index register. Index register. Good. What does the index register hold? Uh, index of the, index. what has an index? An array. an array has an index. So it holds the index of an array. You're doing array processing. What else? Is the program counter in there? The program counter is in there. Excellent. Ooh. From two years ago. I'm yeah. impressed. Oops. Program counter. It wasn't even on the board either. <laughs> What's another thing that happens whenever you call a function? What well, gets allocated on the what? Run. So what else is Stack it? Pointer. Stack pointer. Remember that? And what's the von Neumann execution cycle? Fetch, fetch decode, increment, increment execute, execute, repeat. So when it does fetch, where does it put it? In the what? It fetches a what? What does it fetch in when, it, when it does fetch? It fetches an instruction. And where does it put it in the CPU? No, not index register, instruction. instruction register. Instruction. 
All right. Is everybody clear on this? Okay. So now, how many bits is each one of these? All right. Now let's do how many bytes. How many bytes is each one of these? The accumulator is what? Well, this each one of these is just one bit, right? So, and this is not in the register bank, but anyway. See, this two-part register bank, this NZVC, that's not in there. It's not in the register bank. The, re the register bank has these. So how many bytes is each one of these? Do you remember? Accumulator is what? Two bytes. Two bytes. Index register? Two bytes. Two bytes. Program counter? Two bytes. Two bytes. Stack, stack finder? Two bytes. Two bytes. Ah, but the instruction register? Three bytes. Remember that? Because an instruction could be one byte long or it could be three bytes long. So maximum size. All right. So this two port register bank is an implementation of the registers. Oh yeah, some of those registers are up there. Um, in the PEP8 CPU. The data buses and furthermore Inside the register bank, the data buses are not bidirectional. They're unidirectional. That's for speed. Okay. And there are two output ports instead of just one output port. So I'll show, I'll show you what that means. Let's see what that means. So here on figure 11.51 is a block diagram of the two port register bank for the PEP8 CPU. Now let's take a look and let's dissect this. So check this out. First of all, it's this big box right here, right? And let's take a look at the interface on the bottom. What do we have coming out? What, do, what arrows do we have coming out? A bus, a -bus and B -bus. B bus. Those are the two ports. They are output ports. All right. And what do we have coming in? The C bus. Now each one of these buses is eight bits wide. Eight bits is how many bytes? One byte. But our accumulator, we know our accumulator is how many bytes? Two. Two bytes. But our buses are only eight bytes or sorry, are only eight bits wide, only one byte wide. So our accumulator, so, so you see all these little rectangles up here? Each, each smaller rectangle is a single byte. And each byte has an address. Now let's count them. Well, we don't have to count them, they're numbered. Zero, one, two, three, the, at the accumulator, contains byte 0 and byte 1. The index register contains byte 2 and byte 3. The stack pointer contains bytes 4 and 5. The program counter contains bytes 6 and 7. The instruction register contains bytes 8, 9, and 10. Are you with me? Then these T registers are internal scratch pad registers. T for temporary. Are you with me? So we have T1, T2, T... See, we have T1, which is byte 11, T2, which is bytes 12 and 13, T3, T4, T5, and T6. So those are bytes 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And now these registers that are addressed, that have addresses from 22 up to 31, are what kind of memory do you suppose? Because we're actually showing their contents, which don't change. So what kind of memory is that? That's ROM. So those are the constant bytes in the bank. Is everybody with me on this? Does everybody understand how that, how that is? So look, some of these registers, the registers at bytes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are visible at the ISA level. What is hiding? Oh, shoot. <laughs> what is abstraction? That's a, what's that short, what is that short? The, the, the answer is hiding abstraction. What's the question? 
Oh, sorry. The, the answer is hiding detail. What's the question? <laughs> oh, man. I'm, <laughs> well, anyway, you, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, abstraction is hiding detail. So what happens is these T registers and these constant registers, those are all hidden at the ISA level. Are you with me? But they're visible down at this logic gate level. At this MIC level, right? At a lower level of abstraction. Does everybody understand the concept there? Okay. And furthermore, okay, so, so this, so, and on the right, we have the control signals. Now, have I explained this slash with the five? Have we done that before? Yeah, the, the, those are five lines. Oh, yeah, we did. We did that before. So, so there is a, this A. Now, this A input coming from the right that has five lines. Why do you suppose there's five lines coming in for this A control? But five, but why are there five? I mean, how do, what does this five relate to inside this big box? The fact that there's what? The fact that there are 32 bytes in the register bank, and 2 to the 5 is 32. Uh, is everybody clear? So what does this A control line select? One of what? One of those what? One of the 32. One of the 32, and whatever value is in this A, that one goes, is going gonna, is gonna to go where? Onto the what? be connected to the, to the A bus. Are you with me? And then why does B have five lines? Because one of these 32 registers is going to be put onto the B bus depending on what the, this, these five B lines are. <coughs> so does everybody see what these are? These are address lines that access bytes in the register bank. Are you with me? And then what about the C line? The C line, there's also five control, uh, control lines for C. And what are those? those are, that accesses one of the 32 bytes. But instead of the C saying what's going to be put on the A bus or what's going to be put on the B bus or what's going to be put on the C bus, what is it going to be? It's not what's going to be put on the Which C bus. It's, it's, going to, it's going to be where the data that's on the C bus is going to be stored. And what do you suppose this load CK is? A That's a clock pulse. And when would do we use the, when do we ever use a clock pulse? When do we ever use a clock pulse on a register? This is a register bank. Do you remember our When do we ever use a clock pulse? When the state changes, so we use the clock. Here, let's go back. I, I feel sure we had a register here. Let's go back to figure 1136. Do you remember what this load, remember how in figure A, the block diagram of a register, this load goes into here? And when do we do the load? The load goes into this clock, right? So how do we, what does that do? We present our data as input to here, and we clock it, and that is stored in there, right? So does everybody see then, let's come back now to this two-port register bank. That's what this load CK does. So this load CK is done in conjunction with what? With the C bus. Are you with me? This load CK is used in conjunction with a C bus. So the way this operates is, if, you, if I want to put something in the high order byte of the X register, what would I do? The high order byte, you understand what we're saying here? So here's the X register, and, and I want to put what's on the C bus into that X register, what would I do? I would put what? On the C control, I would put Z. Yeah, you'd put, yeah, you'd put, so, so on the C, on, on C, we would make C 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and then we would clock, and then we would clock uh, load.
load CK, and then and then whatever is on the C bus, and then this and then what that would cause to happen is the, the um, data on C bus on C bus is clocked into the high order the high order byte of which register index. yes high order byte of the index register does everybody see how that what that how that works So that's the picture. Next time we'll see how it's implemented. Here it is actually. It's the last figure in the, that we'll talk about in this chapter. Here's the implementation of it. You just have some multiplexers and decoders and there's the register bank. It's really pretty simple. But we'll take a look at those details next time. Those are, de those are hidden at this level of abstraction. This is a block diagram. Are we good? All right, well, have a great Thursday. See you on Monday.